so let's uh, begin with some of the stats like uh, what uh, indian railways is uh, one of the largest fourth largest uh, railway systems in the world uh, with uh, behind us uh, china russia so uh, as you can see in the stats they have 64000 uh, kilometers of uh, railway track being built and it ferries close to about 30 million passengers on a daily basis right and the uh, uh, you know the revenue itself which is generated by indian railways on a, uh, as of study which has been 2017 and 18 is close to about 27 billion dollars so this itself is a staggering um, you know stats which are uh, actually itself makes uh, indian large uh, indian railways one of the largest uh, among one of the largest uh, railway systems in the world right so uh, when you uh, think about uh, such a large uh, you know um, uh, railway system um, fearing 30 million passengers on a daily basis there are uh, errors which are bound to happen uh, these errors could be uh, you know uh, either through human errors or through uh, infrastructure errors when i say infrastructure it mainly means uh, i mainly uh, meant to say like a, a railway track being broken or uh, one of the machine part being uh, you know uh, uh, machine part not working properly or anything like that right so those things are some of the things uh, which happen so let's look at those stats also so uh, as you can see uh, on the slide that most of the errors which are happened are mainly because of the human error so 86% of uh, the total accidents which have happened in the 6 years of uh, survey is mainly because of the human errors which have happened right so among among those so 86% of the human errors uh, 41% are just with respect to the indian railway staff itself right so uh, when uh, this actually uh, you know uh, Uh, we started thinking more on this and we wanted to dig more as to 41% of uh, you know indian railway staff that's almost close to half of the indian railway staffs are actually making uh, some mistake uh, which is actually causing uh, accidents which would would, would be catastrophic right so uh, when we did a little bit more digging we saw that uh, you know it uh, close to about 74% of the case accidents were mainly because of the drowsiness detection right and uh, drowsiness detection is such a thing that you know you don't have your eyes on the road uh, that's the general uh, logo which many people say so in this case it's the you don't have your eyes on your railway track right so and uh, this would actually in turn lead to a lot more other accidents like uh, you know uh, being animals and uh, you know um, people being run over or something like that so that starts also we just try to look into and we have like 32000 uh, you know animals being run over in the 6 years of uh, study which we did right so uh, when we looked into this uh, stats it was pretty evident that uh, uh, drowsiness detection was one of the uh, root problems which we'll have to solve using computer vision so uh, so so here it is so computer vision so here i am here to we did some lot of research and um, you know uh, we thought and we could solve uh, these two problems main drowsiness detection in train drivers and obstacle detection in uh, railway tracks so uh, i we did a lot of research and uh, i'm here to present solutions to these two uh, problems right um, okay so uh, our solution mainly involves a combination of uh, two kinds of technology which would involve uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence when i say uh, big data specifically it with it would deal with uh, streaming platforms such as spark and kafka and artificial intelligence is specifically uh, with respect to computer vision so uh, for the benefit of the people who have uh, no idea of what spark and uh, kafka are so spark is an uh, in in memory in Uh, in memory uh, cluster computing framework right uh, let me break down those big sentence in memory cluster computing framework so basically what it means is in memory in the sense so the data is being processed in the ram and uh, cluster computing is the data has been processed across the worker uh, machines or specifically uh, machines you know cluster format which have uh, coordinated with each other right so uh, so basically uh, apache spark is a it's very quick and very fast compared to our uh, predecessor hadoop ecosystem platforms right so um, so apache uh, spark mainly consists of uh, works on uh, you know a driver and a worker node kind of architecture rather than a master slave architecture which was done in hadoop systems so uh, I, this i'll probably uh, move on to kafka now 
So Kafka is actually works on a is a streaming platform, which is the is an open source streaming platform which is built by LinkedIn, right? So um, so what happens in uh, Kafka is that you have your uh, producer and your consumer with a broker in between. Uh, so uh, when the producer tries to uh, produces the data with and that data is we each producer produces its own data and the, that data has been um, unique to that producer and you have a topic which is assigned to that and then you uh, if a consumer wants to and that uh, data is stored in the broker uh, in the partition specifically and if a consumer wants to uh, consume that data you need to subscribe to, you need to be subscribed to that particular topic and then you can consume the data so uh, a very good analogy uh, to this would be like let's say you're trying to put something into the box and you want to lock the box with a key right if, if you want to actually someone else wants to take that you know whatever data you put into the box or uh, anything which is there in the box you need the specific key right so that key is the analogy for the topic here so your uh, consumer has to be subscribed to that particular topic to consume the data so uh, if you had observed that uh, I said both uh, Spark and uh, Kafka are uh, streaming platforms. So you, uh, a question would be like, why would if both are streaming platforms? Why are we considering both? Uh, you know. Uh, so um, the key, main key difference is Kafka is a, just a streaming platform which will help you actually to stream the data itself. So there is no processing in that. So Spark is actually good in processing the data. Right. So here we have uh, combined both uh, Spark and Kafka. So advantage of Kafka, which is uh, streaming, and uh, advantage of uh, Spark is, is a very fast uh, processing of the data. So we introduce a platform called a Spark Real Time Platform. Uh, so this is we uh, we introduce this. I mean, it's a kind of a base platform which we work on, which we will build, which I'll build on in a couple of um, slides more. So as you can see in the architecture, uh, you have your Kafka cluster, which I was talking about, and then you have your Spark streaming and the executor and the receiver, right? So here you in the broker, uh, the as I said, you keep your data there as a producer produces the data and it keeps your data there. And then it is being streamed across continuously receives high data API, as you can see, to the uh, receiver there. So and your uh, execution of these um, you know, execution of these uh, data is being done in your receiver. So uh, specifically, uh, you have, uh, there are particular jobs which are being um, uh, run in the receiver. Uh, that's how Spark works. So uh, when I say jobs, uh, jobs could be as simple as uh, adding uh, two plus two numbers or as complex as uh, image processing, which I would be uh, touching upon in, uh, in my uh, couple of slides next. So uh, why uh, why did we choose a streaming platform? I mean, why do we have to use a Spark streaming platform? Um, we could as well uh, do it with normal uh, Java coding or uh, Python coding or as such, right? So uh, the advantages are uh, many because of the parallelism, simplified parallelism. So when I say simplified parallelism, right? So the number of uh, partitions which have been generated in the Kafka broker would be the same as uh, uh, RDD partitions which are be there in the Spark. So it's easy, it's e it can be easily be transformed as in the data can be easily be streamed from the Kafka to, to the receiver and the processing can happen extremely fast there. So if you think about normal uh, parallel processing in the normal uh, you know day-to-day uh, -day programming languages like Java or anything for that then you will have to either use a multi-core uh, processing or uh, you know multi-threaded but uh, these uh, plat uh, these frameworks already come in built in, in built all these and extremely fast even more fast so uh, efficiency so yeah as I said so the, these uh, platforms are uh, you know real-time uh, streaming platforms right so when I say when I meant uh, when I say real-time they are I mean actually you can achieve real uh, real time um, you will see how because in the couple of slides which I show um, you can actually achieve real time but in the when you use your normal uh, Java or anything for that matter any other uh, coding language uh, it, it, it becomes a little hard to achieve real-time processing Right, and the fi final thing is the speed. As I already mentioned, Spark is an uh, uh, in-memory uh, uh, data processing platform. So uh, the speed at which it uh, processes the data is extremely fast. So um, we move on to the first uh, 
topic of uh, our solution that is the drowsiness detection. So this is the high level uh, solution architecture of what we have uh, proposed. So um, as you can see, uh, there's a person drowsing, so the train uh, driver is drowsing there. So uh, the SRTSP platform, which I was actually previously mentioned, so you would be uh, wondering where does that fit into this entire picture. So as you can see, uh, SRTSP platform, uh, you have the video cameras which have been fitted into the train cab. So engine cabs basically, right? And in strategical uh, uh, locations such that the train uh, driver's faces are uh, visible properly with respect to, uh, you know, um, with respect to his face, which is more important as of now. So, um, so those uh, live streams when the cameras are initiated, so the live streams data which keeps flowing, uh, move through these Spark uh, Kafka integration and move to the uh, OpenCV drowsiness processing layer. And if the drowsiness is detected, then an alarm is generated. So this is where the uh, SRTSP platform, which I introduced to you, introduced you guys to uh, fits in. So uh, this is the entire uh, drowsiness uh, detection uh, solution or the architecture we have come up with. So let's move uh, more deep into OpenCV uh, drowsiness processing layer. So uh, when, you, when, you, when you think about uh, drowsiness detection, right? So uh, Mainly, uh, when a person is drowsing, uh, y you uh, see that uh, it's it's common that a person's head keeps uh, you know um, falling like this when he's drowsing, or most of the time some people are uh, tend to fall forward like this, or some people when they're drowsing they hold their hands like this and sleep, right? So those are some of the common things that I mean, any person uh, human who is drowsing involuntarily action are bound to happen. So our solution, we try to move it, uh, you know, we do spatio-temporal uh, detection of, uh, um, spatio-temporal detection of drowsiness detection. Uh, when I say spatio-temporal, it means uh, detection of, uh, you know, facial features and the uh, head post movement also across the frames which keeps coming as a uh, live stream, right? So that's how our solution works. So uh, yeah, as I said, the SRTSP method is actually used to stream the images continuously. And um, yeah, so if the drowsiness detection is uh, detected, a level one alarm would be sounded. So what this level one alarm is, I will touch upon in the com coming slides. Right, so, uh, so to detect uh, the drowsiness detection, we have, uh, we need a couple of things. First thing is the two, uh, 2D uh, facial points of your uh, face. Um, specifically to be with respect to the eyes, the tip of your nose, or extreme points of your mouth, or the tip of your chin, right? These are the 2D facial points which we will be needing, and we need a 3D uh, equivalent facial points of these 2D points. When I meant 3D equivalent facial points, that means the 3D points of your uh, eyes, mouth, and nose, and all that. So uh, we we uh, got this uh, points from a pre-trained uh, model in Dlib, which actually uh, people have already uh, trained multiple uh, mm, faces and uh, identified these points and have, tried, have given out to the community for usage. So you can have your 2D and your 3D points, which have been, uh, we can get the 2D and the 3D points from those pre-trained models. So as you can see in the slide, the images are there. So this extreme left one is a 2D facial points of the face. And the extreme right one is a 3D facial points corresponding to the 2D facial points which we need. So the uh, next uh, step would be after we get the 2D and the 3D facial points we feed, we need to find out the rotation and the translation of a uh, rotation and the translation. So uh, why do we need to do the rotation and the translation? So when I say, uh, as I previously mentioned, that uh, when your uh, person is drowsing, he's involuntarily uh, trying to push his head down. So this becomes your translation. In the, when I say in OpenCV terms, translation means a point A to point B that moves, right? The point that line is what we call as a translation. And a rotation is because when a person moves, uh, it's sometimes he's like, he's doing this when he's sleeping like this. So uh, at that particular point, he's trying to rotate. So we uh, open CV, uh, so this problem is called a solve perspective point problem, which open CV uh, 
helps us to give the rotation and the translation given the 2D and the 3D points matrix, right? So uh, once we get the, uh, once we uh, get the uh, rotation and the translation uh, matrix, we can substitute that in the equation which has been given there, uh, as you can see. Uh, that is the R and the T are the rotation and the translation matrix and considering U, V, W as the 2D uh, points, we get X, Y, Z uh, as a 3D facial points. So when I say 3D facial points, it means like consider the X, Y, Z axis, right? So you have your 3D point or 3D face uh, as to, as to uh, if you keep moving, I mean at what point is it uh, face, uh, face is at what point in the 3D space. So that's what uh, X, Y, Z axis really means. So that's how you get that. So, um, so in all this, uh, how does the head pose uh, detection, once we get the 3D points, right, in the 3D space, uh, we actually, uh, if, we, if we have a negative, like uh, X, either, either of the X or the Y value as negative, then, it, then we have considered that as to be the head pose detection or he's feeling a little drowsy. The reason is because when, if you, if you, if you can just imagine uh, your face in the X, Y, Z axis and you're trying to uh, do uh, this action, right, involuntarily, so your uh, quadrant keeps changing in the sense that it, it goes into the negative quadrant in the sense uh, X becomes negative and Y becomes negative. So a Z would be uh, positive, but uh, your uh, values of X and Y will be negative, so from that we can actually, that becomes kind of a hook to identify whether the person is drowsing with respect to the action of his head. Yeah, so uh, when we come next to the, now I just uh, mentioned with respect to the action of the head, we not only limit our solution to the action of the head, but we limit, uh, we uh, move a one step ahead and try to find out the facial features of the face, which actually is a little important, is as equally important as the head movement also. Um, so we have, uh, we do that calculation using uh, two things. One is the EAR and the MAR. So what is EAR? I, uh, eye aspect ratio and MAR is a mouth aspect ratio. So when you say EAR, it means um, eye aspect ratio is how wide open your eyes are and MAR means how wide open your mouth is. So why do we need, obviously EAR, you, you guys would have uh, guessed it. So MAR is a mouth aspect ratio means you need to find out how, how large his yawns are, right? So and how many times he's opening and closing his mouth. So uh, based on that, we try to uh, put a threshold and we try to find out whether the person is uh, feeling drowsy or not, I mean, uh, with respect to the facial features. Yeah, as I, as I told you, this is the EAR and uh, so when you can get those uh, points, P2, P3, P6, P5 and P1 and P4, so uh, if you can find out the length or the distance between your upper eyelid and the lower eyelid and, uh, and across your eyes, Right, so you can try to find out whether uh, the, pers the person's eyes is closed or it's open. So you can substitute the for, uh, numbers in those formulas and you can get the EAR values, right? So similarly, you have your MAR value where uh, the number of times a person is yawning. So you can uh, get those points and try to find out the Euclidean distance between the upper uh, lip and the lower lip and tries to find out how wide open his uh, yawns are and how many times he's yawned. And because uh, the definition of a yawn itself is different for different people. And um, you know, uh, we, we, we have a threshold like, and then we, uh, based on that, we try to find out whether the person is really yawning or he's just opening his mouth just for like, I don't know, something else talk or some stuff like that, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so as you can see in the picture, um, you can see the top left picture, right? So the eyes are closed and uh, the person is sitting in the head with the uh, head on his ha arm like this and uh, uh, the yawn count is 30. And uh, the both, both the head pose and the facial expression match and that's how the drowsiness is, uh, alert is detected. So, but when you say, when you take the, top right, so the eyes are open and he's just sit, sitting normally, right? So I mean, uh, so that really doesn't count and his head pose action is also straight. So it really uh, doesn't show that any, there are no signs that he's actually kind of uh, sleepy. 
but uh, in the bottom left if you come so even the eyes are closed even though his eyes are closed and yawning count is 18 it is not been detected that he is drowsing but on the extreme right that is a bottom right so he's you can see that the eyes are closed and the drowsiness is alerted because uh, again with respect to his head pose detection and uh, as i previously mentioned that uh, you know um, uh, alarm would be sounded uh, we we have coined the term called level 1 alarm now what is this level 1 alarm so when i, when I say level 1 alarm when it's uh, detected that a drowsy person is drowsing so uh, through the extended system uh, our camera would be connected to a music player and uh, emergency brake if a person is actually drowsing uh, then the music player would be played and if still if continuous uh, detection of drowsiness happens then the emergency brake would be applied to the train so the train automatically stops even though he is drowsing so the, uh, this is the kind of uh, detection which we have proposed in our solution yeah so next we come to the obstacle detection yeah so this is the architect solution architecture which we have uh, proposed in a solution for obstacle detection right so we have a um, again the srtsp is plays a center central part or the base platform and then uh, when the streaming of images happen it moves to the pre processing layer and the visual recognition layer and then finally the alarm system so the alarm system is again a level 2 alarm here it is not uh, the same as what uh, we have we, which I mentioned in the level 1 alarm, I would be touching upon that in a couple of slides. So, uh, as I said, the SRTSP platform would be the base platform where uh, the images have been continuously streamed. So, the difference here is that a camera would be placed on top of the engine and not inside the engine. The camera would be placed on top of the engine in such a way that what is coming in front uh, of the railway track can be easily visible right uh, which I can specifically show you here right so there a camera now it's just the camera is down but uh, actually the camera would be on the top of the engine so it's easily possible to see what is there on the railway track like that person is being detected there right so uh, that's that's how you can actually detect a person and uh, once you uh, camera is placed on top of the engine the frames are continuously streamed and again through the SRTSP we move through all this uh, layers and we finally detect the alarm so specifically what happens when you place a camera on top of the engine or um, we have to uh, there is one constraint which keeps coming up right uh, with uh, we uh, like uh, rain mist and uh, you know uh, those kind of stuff extreme glare and uh, no light at all right uh, so these are the challenges which we'll have to kind of uh, uh, solve because uh, you know uh, trains can be uh, trains move in all kind of weather conditions either in rain or mist or anything like that so using open cv platform so we open cv library we can solve most of this so uh, in the image pre-processing layer what we do is basically we try to remove the uh, rain mist and uh, we also kind of um, check whether it is extremely dark or extremely bright and uh, and we try to uh, you know normalize these kind of uh, or remove this kind of noise as much as possible so that the detection of the object in front of it becomes extremely easy so as you can see this is uh, uh, is bright and is dark is a detection uh, you know uh, is a pre uh, detection of whether the image is bright or is dark or and uh, and is there a rain or mist in the image so uh, the technique is actually with respect to hsv value which we take for to detect the brightness and the darkness and uh, with respect to uh, detecting whether it's a rain or a mist we use a uh, laplacian variance to so uh, detect it yeah so once it has been detected then the next part would be to clear it either to increase the brightness or to the decrease the brightness right so we add a constant value to every pixel in the image to increase the brightness if the glare is just too much then we try to reduce it by a constant value for every image so that it becomes to a certain extent considerably so that the object can be easily detected so next one would be uh, removing the rain and the mist Right. So what happens, we use a, a guided filtering uh, in uh, OpenCV 
Uh, so it basically is just a technique in, or a, you can say a filter in OpenCV which has been provided to help us uh, uh, blur out the rain and then try to remove it. And uh, so that technique is what we use to remove the rain and the mist in uh, images. So uh, finally we have uh, the object detection layer. So once all the pre-processing is done, we move, uh, we come to the final uh, object detection we, which we use YOLO V3. So uh, YOLO V3 we use because of the speed and the accuracy. As of now, currently uh, those uh, algorithms, is YOLO is one of the leading algorithms with respect to speed and accuracy. So we use that and we try to detect. As you can see in the image, uh, a bear has been detected on a railway track and a car is uh, detected. And then, so this image is specifically uh, with respect to the railway station in Bangalore, which uh, we have taken a picture of. And uh, as you can see that uh, uh, this image of uh, is being uh, taken, um, you know, of a person on the railway track, a person who's trying to cross the railway track, and uh, that has been detected by YOLO. So even though it is dark and there is some amount of light, it's been able to detect it. So uh, as I said, the level two alarm would be sounded, right? So the level two alarm is actually mainly uh, when obstacle is detected, uh, the camera is uh, connected to an uh, emergency brake, right, and a horn. So when the uh, obstacle is detected, the horn is sounded, and if the obstacle is still not moving or is continuously being uh, detected, then the uh, emergency brake would be applied. Uh, the table represents the accuracy in which we have and the time uh, in which it has been detected. So it bear, bears took about 32 seconds and person took about 29 seconds and the car took about 30 seconds with actually very good accuracies. Yeah, uh, so the obstacle detection, we use a long range camera, right? So um, the, when you say a long range camera, if you, if you have a straight uh, railway track and most of the times it is straight, you have uh, like close to about five to 10 kilometers of vision using a long range camera. And uh, if you apply an emergency brake, right? So if for, let's say at this moment, a, a person applies an emergency brake or the train driver. So next uh, one kilometer, the train would stop depending on the load. Right. So you have a good amount of gap or the distance uh, so that it can stop. Yeah. Here that goes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Suppose if you want to <coughs> detect the drownness in the car inside inside the car. Sorry, I didn't inside the car. Inside the car. Okay. A driver drownness. Oh. So uh, whether you need to use this yes or TPC no right. From the camera itself, we can directly uh, take the images and... Yeah, uh, you could do that. So uh, the reason, uh, so you have, we have multiple cameras, right? One on top of the engine and one inside the engine. So uh, with respect to the efficiency of how good your uh, code is you want and how quickly you want it, you can use SRTSP. No, no, so, suppose in the inside the car, the camera will be inside the car itself, right? Okay, okay. So that time, so no need of this SRTSP. No, uh, the SRTSP is actually a streaming platform, right? So uh, it, it mainly increases your efficiency of the code, that's it. Okay. So that's what we done, because here we need uh, everything to happen uh, extremely quick and uh, precise, right? And we have multiple cameras there. So when you try to write multiple codes for each camera, it, it you know, you, it tends to get slow. Okay. So that's the reason we use SRTSP. But in the, in, in the case of a car, that yeah, is, it will just, be... The, the camera and the board, uh, that whatever yeah. the board will be just like... Yeah, you uh, don't need to that, that time because no. this normal OpenCV itself gives you... Uh, you can just video capture it and try to read the frames. That should be enough. Yeah, okay. Then in case of this uh, rain detections, can you little elaborate that how you are uh, removing the rain from the images? Okay, uh, so what we do is there's something called as a guided uh, filtering technique. So what happens is uh, you basically have your clear image and you have your guided... Uh, uh, and then you have a normal image. So basically when you feed that uh, clear image and the normal image to the guided filter, it tries to blur out your uh, rain, uh, rain part of it and tries to retain the background what is existing there, right? So in that way, it actually removes the rain. So this has to be done with multiple iterations to get a very good, uh, uh, you know, clarity of the image. Yeah. So the car we are, means the camera is fit in the ca car or a uh, train. So it will be like it is a motion. So it will be, we'll get the little jigger. 
yeah get drinks so how we avoid that kind of problem? yeah so those uh, things are like uh, again the noise part of it which we'll have to take care and uh, sometimes uh, if you think of a train it keeps uh, moving straight and uh, the stability of the camera also matters with respect to the outside so that the camera has to be fixed tightly and uh, so that also matters so that vibration of the camera how will be avoided so uh, we haven't actually uh, touched upon that area of uh, uh, vibration of the camera but uh, i think it doesn't happen much because uh, uh, the, the the train not mu not much of vibration happens in a train so where the camera so has to be so the vibration actually happens when the camera is moving like this right okay. so what if the camera is not moving and it's tightly fixed on top of the engine okay so but the body the train body is moving right? yeah i understood what you're trying to say is the train body is moving fast so that's what i want to uh, think uh, but first thing is uh, we haven't touched upon that area and uh, from from the top of the head what i can think of is because if the camera is exactly not moving too uh, tightly fixed i think the slides would come uh, without a vibration okay so uh, this is actually uh, a solution which we thought about uh, if we uh, deploy this in the real time or the production level uh, a lot more actually uh, problems would come up uh, come up okay so that we'll have to think about and solve for in case of the object detection so why are you using the yolo v3 there is something called a single dot uh, detection and all so compare it with the single dot detection so what is the difference with the yolo yeah, I, i think uh, you are mentioning the ssd yeah uh, yeah yes, yes so ssd algorithm uh, it, it detects the uh, it, it gives a good accuracy but what happens one uh, drawback of that is uh, if if you have a uh, images which is very small right the accuracy is uh, come down Uh, drastically so but that doesn't happen with yolo v3 uh, because it it uh, implements something called as an fpn so filter processing network so based on that what happens is even though if the images are small it tries to enlarge and try to uh, detect the object so ssd that is not implemented okay thank you yeah.